Wild Health is about optimizing you. We use genomics, blood work, biometrics, microbiome assessment, many other tests, and a conversation with you to come up with a full health optimization plan. What's the perfect diet, exercise, and supplement plan for you and only you? The Wild Health Podcast is about optimizing all of us. Here we cover the cutting-edge science that gives you the base to be able to apply the personalized plan we give you as a patient. To sign up as a patient, go to wildhealth.com. Or if you're a physician or health coach and you want to learn how to do this for your patients, we're happy to help as well. Wildhealth.com for all the information on becoming a patient or working with us. All right, Carl Seeger, thanks for coming back on. Always a pleasure, my friend. What's happening? What do you got for me today? Um, well, you know, outside of the holiday season, um, we are still going to talk about alcohol. Um, it's about time that we did a bit of a deeper dive into, um, alcohol and our health. I figured we could kind of take the first stab around, uh, is alcohol good for you? Um, and, uh, what sort of, uh, um, what sort of nuances there are there? Because, you know, that, that may seem like a rhetorical question, but there, there's some evidence around moderate alcohol intake and health benefits that I think is worth going into. Um, and then, uh, maybe some tips on how people can, uh, moderate or, uh, control their alcohol intake. Right. So big topic. Um, we'll start wherever you want. What, what do you define as moderate? Cause I'm, my moderate might be uh, different than your moderate, just different. Yeah. Me. I mean, you know, you know, the age old saying about, uh, an alcoholic is somebody who drinks more than the doctor. Oh, um, that, I, uh, I love that one. <laughs> I was, I thought you were going to use the, like the, the, uh, Supreme court definition of pornography. I know it when I see it kind of thing, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I don't know what, well, I think you could probably use that for excessive drinking. Yeah, right. I think you could definitely say what's excessive drinking. Well, I don't know exactly how to define it, but you know, when you see right. it, um, I think moderate drinking in the scientific literature, um, there's definitely some varied definitions, but I, I kind of like the one to two drinks a day as moderate drinking I you know, my own, preference would be sort of in in my mind moderate drinking is probably three to seven drinks a week yeah so i i actually think i yeah i, I know that's the the kind of the scientific i guess maybe definition i think that's somebody made that up somewhere sometimes oh, it's just made yeah. up for sure I, I think there's a lot of variance depending on the person i mean i know it is you know like full disclosure for me like if I, you know, have nowadays, if uh, this is, we're talking Carl Seeger, 43 year old Carl Seeger, not um, 23 year old Carl Seeger. But if I have, you know, one or two drinks a week, that's a lot for me. Um, just mm -hmm. I, the amount of sleep disruption I get with it is where like I, you know, like uh, one or two drinks in a, in a sitting, I'm going to get, I'm going to, I'm not going to sleep that night. And that's just the way it is. And so I, I define. Well, I think for people who are for people who are sleep focused, yeah. um, and uh, you know, I count myself in that in that same crew. Um, I think we're like coming up on teetotalers um, <laughs> in terms of like how much we drink. Yeah. I mean, I I really um, I'm the the same boat personally. I I, I really drink rarely um, and and only in sort of certain occasions these days. So, um, you know, but before we, yeah. we tell people, uh, uh, that, uh, that, you know, alcohol is terrible for yeah. your sleep and you should not drink it. I think, um, let's, let's dive in a little bit to sort of what, um, you know, if we're going to call it three to seven drinks per week, I mm -hmm. think we got to have the, the standard, sure. um, what's a standard drink. Um, so that's like 14 grams of alcohol, which everybody can immediately know what that means. Right. <laughs> right. I, I definitely put my alcohol in grams. Um, every, well, I've had seven grams. I think I'm done. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what that means. Uh, I think like all right, yeah, but a standard ahead. drink of fourteen grams. I think I think and correct me if I'm wrong here. My my uh, my understanding is that that's basically like 
one shot of alcohol, yeah. one glass of wine, one 12 ounce serving of beer. Um, right. and even within that, obviously there's a whole lot of variants, yeah. right? You come out to Portland and get yourself <laughs> an 8% alcohol by volume beer yeah. in a 16 ounce glass and you're having much more than 14 grams. Right. So, but I, I think it's just a general rule of thumb that like the average shot of alcohol, average pour of wine, average 12 ounce beer is going to be about 14 grams of alcohol. All right. All right. That sounds good. I feel good about that. <laughs> um, well, cool. I, All right. So talk to me. Is it healthy? Is, is there any, and, and when I say, is it healthy, um, is there any evidence to suggest that drinking a mild to moderate amount of alcohol provides health benefits that you wouldn't otherwise get if you drank no alcohol? I think that's the, that's sort of how, how I want to understand whether alcohol has a health benefit is, you know, take, take a bunch of people, some of them drink moderately, some of them don't drink at all. Any reason to think that well, the ones who drink moderately have some health benefit? Yeah. I mean, I think this is an, you know, I, this is going to be lame, but it depends. And I, I guess it depends if you take those group of people and are they drinking together? Uh, but but um, I, I would say, so I, I kind of break this down into think about a cardiovascular disease risk. And when you look at the relationship between moderate alcohol consumption and cardiovascular disease, it, it's kind of complex and the evidence is mixed. Um, there's been plenty of studies that show that if people who drink moderately have a reduction in heart disease and cardiovascular disease, there's been studies that contradict that. Um, we, we think that maybe, you know, low levels of alcohol intake, like what we're talking about, moderate to low, are inversely associated with mortality in both men and women. Now, there's different amounts, of, amounts and we can go into, there's how much we're drinking per men and, and women, but um, we think that the benefit may be from antioxidants in like red wine that we're seeing in some studies and then some studies not. It, there's confounders though because there is this social component that's involved with it. We do see on, you know, sort of to be contrarian is that there are increased alcohol consumption and at, at, at moderate levels can be associated with atrial fibrillation and irregular heartbeat and and high blood pressure, which we know are associated with cardiovascular disease, with heart disease. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. Um, but then I kind of look at people's risk of, of, of diabetes. We talk about people's risk of diabetes with heart disease as well. Hold on. All I'm right, going to stop, stop you there, Carl. Stop me. I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to say... I think that the uh, the weight of evidence around alcohol consumption yeah. and cardiovascular disease outcomes, I'm gonna, I, I, you know, I, I'm a big fan of making people commit. Yeah, I'm gonna commit, and I'm gonna say I think that the relative risk reduction of cardiovascular related outcomes in people who moderately drink is around 0.75 compared to the, those who don't drink, okay. um, and this is. Um, you know, British Medical Journal uh, Association of Alcohol Consumption with Selected Cardiovascular Disease Outcomes, Systematic and, uh, Review and Meta-Analysis. There's also some, you know, individual trials, my favorite of which being the alcohol consumption and mortality, the Ludwig Schaffen Risk and Cardiovascular oh, Health Study. Oh, the Ludwig Schaffen. So that's that's uh, oh. the Ludwig Schaffen. That's about 3,500 3, 3, uh, uh, German patients hospitalized for coronary angiography. Where they looked at uh, at hazard ratios for uh, for heavy drinkers, which guess what had the yep. highest increased mortality, yeah. and um, and a reduced risk for low volume drinkers. Although when you adjusted for cardiovascular risk factors, the low volume drinkers were the same as folks who don't drink. So okay. I think the best evidence we have is that it doesn't hurt your cardiovascular risk outcomes to be a low to moderate alcohol consumer, and it may help. I, so I don't know. I, I'm interested in what your perspective is. It is so hard for me to gleam a lot from those studies. And I know that people are, are uh, I guess, fancy math doers. <laughs> I don't know what a better term is. but And they're able to, to control for a lot of factors. I think it's really hard to control for reporting in patients, especially around alcohol. And, and so I take 
pretty much all these like retrospective studies with that are uh, looking at people's reporting of alcohol consumption with a grain of salt like for sure um, for sure i think i think we'll put the link to this uh to this yeah. bmj study in the in the chat though too i think it's um you know and there are to uh to to throw you a bone here with your um, sort of uh, fence straddling <laughs> uh, with regards to cardiovascular mortality, there are outlying studies that that demonstrate either an increased risk or or no benefit. But if you're looking, I'm looking at two separate sort of uh, forest plots of both incident coronary heart disease associated with alcohol consumption and uh, cardiovascular mortality, and you've got like you know in one plot you've got about 20 studies and the other about 35 okay. and 90 plus percent of these studies have people well below the average risk if they're low to moderate alcohol consumers and separating that out to your your as a you know as a nod to your comment on are people yeah. drinking alone um, yeah. you know I, to my knowledge none of these have separated out whether this is whether low to moderate alcohol consumption is in is confounded by social interaction. And, right. you know, we've had these uh, conversations both often on the podcast before about the value of relationships and overall mortality, the value of, um, you know, play and overall mortality. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it's very possible that this is just a surrogate, you know, low to moderate alcohol consumption is a surrogate marker for getting together with people and being social. Um, so I don't know that there's anything magic about the alcohol. Like it yeah. could be if people had tea parties, maybe the, <laughs> that was what, what we'd see the same effects with, with, uh, herbal tea. <laughs> Not where I grew up. There's no tea parties there. Like, no, no, no. It's a big if. <laughs> pretty sure you get your, get your butt kicked for that suggestion. Can we have a tea party? Sounds like it. Yeah. It sounds like <laughs> it. All right. All right. Well, you were going to get yeah. to, you were getting into alcohol. We'll, we'll put a pin in that right. and we'll say unknown. Um, well, but can I, can I get you to agree that uh, low to moderate alcohol consumption is pretty convincingly not harmful for cardiovascular outcomes? I, yes. Fine. Fine. Okay. All right. That's, you can see. That's fine. Well, let me, let me hear what you think about risk of diabetes. Um, with alcohol consumption. So it is my understanding that some studies have shown that moderate alcohol consumption is associated with actually a lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes. However, to ride the fence, as I like to do, um, because I like to be like, it depends, because it does depend, damn it, Mike, um, is, is that the other side is that there's this calorie intake and glucose load and what you drink. And... Um, I think it's hard because there's some, uh, I think there is some evidence that alcohol improves insulin sensitivity and glucose metabolism, but we do know that um, calorie intake and a glucose load with, a, you know, like a, a liquid calories increases people's risk of diabetes and, and insulin resistance. And so, uh, like, how quickly you're able to you know, rein in your glucose load is very dependent on the person, but I think it also depends on what you drink. Um, and that there are some alcoholic beverages that have a, you know, frankly, a higher glycemic index than others. Um, and yeah, so not to ride the fence too much. I think there is some evidence that supports, uh, improved insulin sensitivity with alcohol consumption. Um, I think it depends on what you drink and what you're drinking on a regular basis. All right, I got two things to right. follow that up with. Right. Number one, um, of course it depends, right? I mean, <laughs> we tell people that dietary fiber is good for them, but we wouldn't tell somebody to eat like, you know, 500 grams <laughs> of dates every day. Yeah. There's a lot of fiber in that, but you're going to pretty much um, max out your glucose levels if you're going to eat that many cool. dates. And, so clearly there's harm and, there. And you're going to poop um, your pants. That's the other thing. You're also going to poop your pants. Um, and I think in the same sense, you know, uh, a shot of, uh, you know, high quality um, <laughs> dark tequila um, not that I have a favorites. preference. <laughs> yeah, right. um, not that I have a preference versus like, uh, you know, an apple teeny, <laughs> um, like clearly there's a lot less glucose in the, um, in the tequila. And, um, you know, we tell people all the time to avoid sugar sweetened beverages. And I don't think there's really a reason why yeah. alcohol should be any it different is. than that. So I agree with you. And then the, um, the second part of my follow-up is, 
sure, there's some evidence that alcohol can improve insulin sensitivity. Have you ever in your nearly 20 or maybe slightly more than 20 uh, year career as a physician told a patient that they should start consuming alcohol to improve their <laughs> insulin and glucose metabolism? No, I have. that would be awesome. I would love to see somebody's face. Listen, I know you don't drink. I know, I know this, <laughs> but your, your hemoglobin A1C is almost six. You need to start, you need to start drinking like tomorrow. Like, yeah. Yeah. Here's a, here's, here's our prescription for a gym membership <laughs> and for BevMo. Yeah, exactly. Here's a discount to your, to, I, I, I don't want to use any specific beverages, but so I, wine coolers yeah. are us. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So we're going to, we're going to, this one's, I think a little less controversial. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think what I take away from the, from what's out there on alcohol and, uh, insulin resistance is, um, a non sugar sweetened alcoholic beverage is unlikely to increase your risk of developing right. diabetes may have some protective effect, may not, but don't start drinking yeah. if you're not just because you want to have a better <laughs> A1C. Uh, so the next thing I think about is, is cognitive function. Um, and I, you know, I, I think, again, I think there's sort of mixed studies here, but some studies have suggest that moderate, uh, to, you know, daily, uh, alcohol consumption, um, may actually be protective against development of dementia and some t cognitive decline. Um, a couple different studies that show lower risk of dementia and specifically Alzheimer's disease, um, as in people who have moderate consumption as opposed to those who completely abstain from alcohol. So again, there's other studies that show the opposite being true that suggest that alcohol consumption may actually increase dementia. So I, uh, and this is what they're defining is uh, uh, in one study specifically in 2018, where they define it as uh, their moderate as 14 drinks per week or less. Um, there's some studies that also look at the your hippocampus, uh, parts of your brain, and look at specific atrophy, and which is a, um, around your hippocampus with a specific feature of Alzheimer's disease um, that show atrophy there with increased alcohol consumption. So again, this sort of feels like a mixed bag, but um, I think there's other factors involved here um, in, in my uh, sort of assessment. Um, I think sleep disruption, again, is uh, a big, we've probably talked about this on this podcast, is, you know, chronic sleep disruption that people see with regular alcohol intake um, and the association with sleep disruption and Alzheimer's and, and different types of cognitive decline is real. So I think that's what's going on here in my assessment is there's other parts of alcohol consumption that it's hard to tease out. Um, when I see mixed bag studies like this, like what we've said with diabetes and cardiovascular disease, I think, you know, low to moderate alcohol consumption, probably not directly associated with Alzheimer's disease. It might be the other things that it's associated with. Yeah, I, I find the, uh, you know, as much as I'd love to latch on, and I know I have older family members who would love to latch on to the, the studies that show yeah. that red wine consumption is preventative for cognitive decline. I think there's enough variation in the outcomes uh, of these studies to say that it's unknown um, whether yeah. or not light to moderate alcohol use has a mildly protective or, or mildly detrimental effect on your risk of cognitive decline. So, okay, we'll yeah. leave that one as unsolved for the, uh, for the ages. Um, and... Yeah. Any other benefits yeah, outside I mean, of, so it sounds I, like, you know, maybe cardiovascular, maybe, maybe diabetes, but yeah. probably never going to tell someone to drink to fix their <laughs> diabetes. Um, and, and who knows with cognitive decline, what, what else do we have? Well, I, th I think the big one that we're, that I put weight into, and I think you do as well is this social connection and the, the benefits around that. Um, and I, I think again, like with this one, I actually feel like you know, too much alcohol, you're gonna like, you know, this is all prefacing that we're not talking about people with a problem. Um, we're talking about people who are drinking, you know, maybe a drink at night, maybe on social occasions. That's what we're talking about here. The connection that people have in a lot of these studies, and that's where we're talking about the Mediterranean diet and the benefit of that. And that's where I, I think it teases out 
the or trying to tease out like what are the benefits from the Mediterranean diet? Well, the you know people talk about the red wine consumption. The big thing involved with all of this and blue zones and the Mediterranean diet is this social connection that people have and that they feel around alcohol and that alcohol disinhibits people and they 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 feel more connected to people and that overall feeling is probably associated with longevity. Um, but uh, I think, you know, like all things, when people have a problem with alcohol, that's different from a social standpoint, but that's not what we're really talking about here. I've got nothing to add to that excellent summary on alcohol and social interaction. I would just uh, say before we pivot to the well-known harms yeah. of excessive alcohol use, we should probably have just a quick uh, public service announcement. So yeah. if you feel that you or a loved one are struggling with your alcohol use, um, and we'll talk about how you might want to assess that in a second, um, both the uh, SAMHSA uh, National Helpline, the National Drug and Alcohol Treatment Hotline, Alcoholics Anonymous, it is one Google search away. You can find somebody 24 hours to talk to and encourage you to do so if that's something that you're suffering with or, or a family or member or loved one is suffering with. In in terms of how do you know if drinking is problematic drinking, um, you know, this is an age old tool that has pretty much stood the test of time, the cage substance abuse screening tool, and this can be adapted for, um, for drug use as well. So um, just to give a more inclusive uh, um, set of questions, we'll adapt it for drug use here. So it's uh, four questions and um, CAGE is an acronym, so C for cut down. So one, have you ever felt you ought to cut down on your drinking or drug use? Um, A is annoyance. Have people annoyed you by criticizing your drinking or drug use? G is for guilty. Have you felt bad or guilty about your drinking or drug use? And uh, G, uh, I'm sorry, E is an eye opener. Uh, so have you ever had a drink or used drugs first thing in the morning to steady your nerves or to get rid of a hangover? So those are the four questions can be done pretty, pretty quickly. Have you ever felt you should cut down? People ever annoyed you by criticizing you? Have you ever felt about, have you ever felt bad or guilty about your use? And have you ever used drugs or alcohol first thing in the morning just to kind of steady things out? If you have a two or greater that's considered clinically significant of uh, a likely problem um, with drug or alcohol use. Um, so definitely would encourage people to ask themselves those questions, uh, use that tool if appropriate with friends or, or family you're concerned about, and to reach out for help if you feel like um, that's appropriate. Um, so let's pivot. Let's yeah. talk about harms. Um, what are some of the harms of excessive alcohol use? Well, I think one of the ones that I, I don't think a lot of people have front and center um, is the actually increased risk of cancer. Um, mm -hmm. And the main one I think of that is this like this, uh, I don't think it's discussed as much, is the significantly increased risk of breast cancer in women. Um, that we're talking, uh, you know, some studies have found that just one alcoholic drink per day increases the risk of breast cancer five to nine percent. Um, so that's that's a big number to me um, with a relatively small amount of alcohol intake. Um, and so I don't I don't think that's like intuitive for people like alcohol and cancer. I think there's other types of cancer, increased risk of colon cancer. Um, liver, but the, the big one is definitely breast that is not discussed, I think, as um, readily as the other ones. Yeah, I mean, I think it kind of intuitive, something along the GI tract would make sense with alcohol. You're drinking alcohol, it's metabolized in the liver. These, you know, the idea of liver cancer, colon cancer seem pretty straightforward, mm -hmm. but um, that was a uh, that was, uh, I mean, I'm sure I knew that for a medical school exam at one point, but uh, that was an eye opener, no pun intended yeah. for me, Carl. I did not yeah. recognize that there was that large of an increase in breast cancer risk with uh, with alcohol consumption. Yeah, and, it, and it's linear that as well. Is like as you increase your alcohol intake, your risk of breast cancer goes up. So, um, 
right. Well, I'll, I'll take I'll take a couple of the yeah. other. Uh, uh, the, I'll t- I'd like to take the low hanging fruit and <laughs> yeah. leave the difficult conversations to you. Yeah. Um, so uh, addiction, uh, I think, pretty straightforward. Um, for some folks, even occasional alcohol use can lead to addiction, particularly in in those who have a family history of alcoholism or who struggle with concomitant mental illness like depression or anxiety. Um, And then another obvious one, risks of accidents and injuries, you know, our our cumulative, uh, you know, 30 or 40 years in the emergency (laughs) department would uh, cement this knowledge for us that um, so many traumatic incidents, whether motor vehicle collisions, bad decisions, jumping off of things, um, (laughs) skill saw accidents. I mean, there's really no end to the number of traumatic injuries yeah. where alcohol played a significant role in um in what transpired. Yeah, especially if you had testosterone and alcohol involved <laughs> yes alcohol plus y chromosome yeah, is, is particularly yeah dangerous. and then all you have to do yeah. is add fireworks <laughs> to, uh, yes it, dude hold my dude beer hold my beer uh, watch four this. of four of the most dangerous yeah. words in the english language yeah. um so i think the big thing we should talk about which i think people know but it's, it seems like I have this discussion on a regular basis these days is just the amount of alcohol and sleep disruption. It seems that – there, so there, here's something I have no evidence for. But it seems that people who when they get into their 30s, um, suddenly there's a lot of people who have sleep disruption associated with alcohol. And they don't necessarily realize it's the alcohol that's doing this, but they – There's clear evidence to show that alcohol suppresses REM sleep um, and, in addition, increases wakefulness. Um, There's – so people tend to have, like, broken up sleep and it disrupts their deep sleep as well. But there's a clear suppression of REM sleep that occurs with – depending on the person, wide variance. So there are some people like myself who I just look at a thimble of alcohol and I'm – pretty sure I'm going to wake up at 2 a.m. with my heart rate, you know, elevated and like trying to figure out what's going on. Um, And then there's people, it doesn't bother. Um, One of the, the, I mean, there's also, we can show that other types of really disordered types of sleep, like sleep apnea, people have in it, and alcohol definitely exacerbates sleep apnea. Um, But just regular, you know, people who don't have sleep apnea um, definitely get altered sleep um now i don't know (laughs) my my conversation i often have with people who come to me and are at you know we're trying to focus on improving their sleep they're they're often really motivated to to do anything to get their sleep kind of dialed in and i don't know if you're having this experience as well where they're willing to do everything and then i bring to them like the the nightly drink that they have they have a you know glass of red wine at night with so with dinner which they have viewed as a health like benefit because of all the things we listed above uh, trying to take that away from them becomes a little bit difficult and i what i've done for this and i want to hear what you're doing for this is i just have them track this um and do trials and just take away the alcohol for a couple nights and see how it goes but there's just a lot of people that get disrupted sleep from small amounts of alcohol take. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're um, motivated to improve your sleep, particularly if you're using a sleep tracker of some kind, um, it, it's pretty uh, readily apparent the effect that alcohol will have on your sleep. But I think that, uh, you know, to nod towards your uh, it depends tendencies, uh, it, it really does for different people make a very big impact in terms of timing of alcohol intake and also um quantity Mm -hmm. and also type right so just personal anecdote i can have i mean i really don't drink much anymore so i this is uh this is maybe from a while back that i last tested this but i could have a tequila drink without sugar and sleep absolutely fine maybe have a slightly elevated heart rate overnight, like, you know, three to five beats per minute faster than usual, and maybe lose a little bit of REM sleep, but not have middle of the night awakenings and not really notice much in terms of sleep disruption. If I have a glass of red wine at night, 
I am up at one thirty in the morning and like without fail. Yeah. And guess what? I don't drink red wine anymore <laughs> because I just don't like how that feels. So, um, you know, it may be that the actual type of spirit makes a difference for some people that the quantity, the timing, um, then there are some cool things that you can try for folks who are really resistant to giving up that evening drink and whether that's like a dry farmed mm -hmm. wine or um, just drier wines in general or making sure that you're going sugar free with a cocktail if that's what people are having in the evening. There's there's ways to um, sort of take a harm reduction lens to folks who um, want to continue to have an evening drink but don't want to continue to have the same level of sleep disruption. So I think it can be nuanced, but it, I don't know many people where it doesn't affect their sleep at all. Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, there's a lot of people who feel like it's not affecting their sleep, but then once they track it, they see the difference and they see changes in you know in the the amount of you know REM and deep sleep, and then they also see and people see changes in their HRV as well. Um, and the, mm -hmm. at least that's my my experience. I don't know the data on disruption of your HRV, but. Um, but it, it definitely changes. It, people will track it and then come back to me and be like, okay, now I'm going to, you know, limit it to X amount of time, you know, because I still enjoy the benefits of, or oh, in the social connection and the, just the taste of red wine or whatever they prefer. Yeah. I mean, and I think we, you know, I think we need to acknowledge the fact that uh, there's no judgment yeah. going on yeah. here. If you enjoy having a drink in the evening, you know, this is, you, you have, uh, all the free will and agency to do it. We're just trying to give some of the background here yeah. for, um, ways it may be helpful, ways it may be harmful. So I hope that it, I, I think we're coming across yeah. that way. I want to make sure that we, we say it out right though. Well, this is not a, uh, a, a judgy environment where we're, uh, and certainly, you know, if I were to look back at my own alcohol use, I'm in no place to judge. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure there's some people somewhere listening to this podcast who knew me as a younger man and were like, that guy has no place to judge, um, for sure. <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, to be side noted and, and, uh, what is the drink that you like? It's like a Moscow mule only with tequila. That is oh, your... uh, how how appropriate to talk about my specific favorite cocktail <laughs> yeah. on an alcohol yeah. episode. Um, no, I have uh, my, my drink when I do drink and I'm going out socially and I am deciding that I want to have a drink. Yeah. And, and this is a great pivot actually yeah. into um, some practical tips to, uh, to moderate your alcohol intake when you're going out um, or when you're drinking and not going out. Um, for me, it's a it's a shot of dark tequila on the rocks with club soda, lime, and bitters. Yeah, okay, um, that's what it is. That's my. Uh, it doesn't have a name um, because I made it up. I thought, uh, I thought we named it at one time. Like it. We named it at one time. It was like we might have. I can't remember exactly what we called Stone it. Stone on uh, the rocks and, or something um, like that. I don't know. Something. <laughs> that sounds horrible. <laughs> I don't want to drink that. Yeah. Um, but uh, but you know if. Um, if we're going to give folks some practical tips yeah. they can take away, I, I know you did a little bit of, uh, of digging into this, but the first thing I wanted to chat about was how familiar are, are you with the fact that um, pre-gaming is a uh, searchable term on PubMed? On PubMed? On PubMed. There are multiple peer-reviewed studies in the medical literature on the um, phenomenon of pre-gaming. Oh, I thought you were going to tell me in the uh, Urban Dictionary, and I was going to be like, well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for those for those of you who who aren't familiar, the, the concept is to uh, drink a bunch before you <laughs> go out to whatever activity it is that you're going to, whether it's a party or a sporting event or a bar or whatever. Um Partly to uh, arrive, some folks do this with the goal of arriving already intoxicated, <laughs> and some folks do this with the goal of not having to pay yeah. for expensive drinks at the location where they're visiting. And I'll just say that um, in part of my research for this podcast, the phenomenon of pre-gaming came up. And guess what, Carl? It's a really bad idea. <laughs> just... um, not only do you get significantly more intoxicated <laughs> than than matched controls who don't pregame, but the uh, but the risk of um, alcohol related accidents and motor vehicle <laughs> collisions increases substantially. So if if we can add one more PSA, don't pregame. <laughs> well, it's just the and the and the 
the number of research subjects that adds to like the number of research topics that people have done that is under the well duh like kind of like who got the funding for that like i don't know there's so many questions i have about <laughs> so great uh yeah but i mean also i imagine that the amount of pre-gaming before going out to dinner probably results in people spending more money and eating way more you know because they're disinhibited they're you know they they go there with the intent of not i'm not going to drink you know x uh, at this place and they pre-game and they probably order what they would have ordered anyway <laughs> and and then a bunch of other food that they don't stop eating yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely uh, don't. There's no studies of pre gaming and long term uh, health outcomes, okay. but I'm pretty uh, pretty suspicious they would show that no, it's not good for your heart or your cognitive health yeah. or anything else for you to yeah. pre game. Um, in terms of practical tips that I'll give patients who are looking to moderate their alcohol intake, um, or even you know friends or 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 uh, or other folks in my life, um. Decide in advance how many drinks you're going to have. Yeah. I mean, it sounds so simple, but even just putting a cap on, I'm not going to have more than X number of drinks tonight. And if you have a problem with binge drinking or regulating that when you have uh, one or two drinks in you already, then have an accountability partner who's there with you who will actually say, hey, that's your third drink. Um, and you wanted me to remind you that you wanted to stop at two or you wanted to stop at three. Hopefully they tell you before you yeah. exceed your limit. Um, staying hydrated. So, uh, you know, one alcoholic drink, one water, alternating back and forth, one way just to kind of pace yourself, um, eating food. Uh, you know, it's remarkable how much more of an effect people can feel from alcohol when they are, uh, on an empty stomach. So, you know, yes, you don't generally, if I'm speaking for myself here, I don't generally make the healthiest food choices, uh, while, uh, when alcohol's in the mix, but, uh, there's no reason you can't make your food choices in advance and maybe pregame by eating something as opposed to pregame by drinking some alcoholic beverages. Yeah, I think one of the tips I give people in, when you talk about having an accountability buddy um, is is actually having, it, especially if this is your spouse or, you know, actually having a, like a sign or a, you know, a, a sort of a, how's it going to go ahead of time and like, it sounds a little cheesy, but I think, um, especially if you have a spouse who you just like kind of pull them aside and say like, Hey, I want to limit at this, um, amount of drinks. The problem is, is when you're at that point, say you're at two drinks or whatever the number is, you just realize you're disinhibited at that point. And somebody telling you, Hey, uh, you, you're, you, you, you know, if they, you're not the you, boss of me, Carl. Of me. Don't tell yeah. me how many how many drinks to have. Just realize that there's a good potential for that to go poorly. Whereas if you know, and people talk about having like a, a sign, like you know, your spouse puts their hand on your right shoulder or whatever, and says, "Hey," and that's it. You don't have to have a big. It, it could, what that actually deters is also um, it helps you keep that social connection and to that person that you love and doesn't kind of create a rift there where you feel like somebody's, you know, um, where you feel guilty or you feel like bad or whatever. Um, but it, and it just makes you kind of like anchor into that decision you'd already made. And so that's definitely something I would advise for people in a relationship where they have an accountability buddy. I think it's, uh, you know, execution is everything, Carl. And, uh, yeah, I think if, uh, if, you know, hypothetically I were to tell my wife that I wanted to have three drinks and no more, <laughs> and I went out and I was starting to pour a fourth drink and she said, you said you were only going to, I don't think I'd react as well as, yeah. uh, I would have, uh, beforehand before those three drinks. So I think that's a great point. Yeah. Um, I mean, are you, are you going like full safe word here, Carl? Yeah. You like, know what my safety I mean, word is, right? Snuffleupagus. I'm scared. Snuffleupagus. <laughs> it's always been the same since I was in college. I came up with that. But uh... your vulnerability <laughs> is, is touching me yeah. right now, Carl. What's your safety word? Do we not talk about that on the? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not talking about right. that. We're going to keep going. Yeah, all right. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, how often? I mean, I remember using that, and a friend of mine in college weren't running into a party yelling "Snuffleupagus, Snuffleupagus," but that's a that's another story. That is another story <laughs> for another non-alcohol related podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, any uh, any other th- stuff that you could think of besides um, you know getting some food on board, uh, avoiding binge, binge drinking? I guess we didn't cover that. So, yeah. uh, as with moderate alcohol consumption. Uh, you know, the definition of binge drinking is pretty broad and somewhat arbitrary. Um, but folks will often say, you know, four or more drinks in a single occasion for women and five or more mm. drinks for men. I'm assuming that that's just sort of average body weight based as opposed to any sort of gender based metabolism. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that I buy into that definition anyway, but a large number, let's just say a, a moderate to large number of drinks in a short period of time. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, if you're sitting there playing a drinking game or doing something otherwise focused on getting as much alcohol into <laughs> it, into you in a short period of time, that's extremely hazardous and very likely to overshoot what you're looking to achieve and put yourself into a, any number of vulnerable positions. So, um, avoid binge drinking. Think about an accountability partner. Set goals before you go out. Eat some food. Yeah. Um, what, any other tips? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that I have actually kind of gone to doing is I, I find that I, especially when I'm at social events, I find that I, I want a drink in my hand. Um, and it, it's a, I, I don't, I think it's like a, I don't know, it just, it just feels better to me. And so I'll do things like a club soda or non alcoholic drink. Um, I usually try to do something without a, you know, big sugar load in it. Um, but, uh, like a, like a club soda or some sort of fizzy water. Like I find that that helps me and can I, I can be social and I'm talking with people having a drink and it feels like it's a little bit of a crutch, but it, it feels better to me and keeps me from having another drink that I wouldn't have otherwise. I like it. Um, and then, uh, you know, if I can add one more pro tip there, put some bitters in it and it actually looks like a real cocktail. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. I have definitely, uh, had the, you know, my, my quote unquote favorite drink with just without the tequila part. And it looks just like it looks with the tequila. So nobody knows if I'm having another drink or we not. We should talk drink. about why you're going to that extensive, like rigmarole, just so you don't feel judged. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I need to find some higher quality friends, yeah. maybe. I'm not sure. Oh, oh. <laughs> not you, yeah, though, yeah, Carl. Yeah, not yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, sure. I didn't take it that way at all. <laughs> no, I mean, I think this is a this, but this is a, a really, um, I think it's, a, you know, the, the same way that you, you know, you call it a crutch um, that you wanted to have sort of a non-alcoholic yeah. but alcoholic looking glass in your <laughs> hand. I think um, there is... You know, people uh, will often feel some sort of judgment, even when you're not judging them, yeah. if you're not drinking while they're drinking. And I think from the, you know, to get back to all of the social and relation relational uh, benefits of um, of gathering and alcohol is often included in those mm-hmm. types of gatherings. I, I tend to do that more so that I, I don't think people think I'm judging them. Yeah. Um, yeah. by not continuing to drink. So, you know, I'm not, I, I think that it's, uh, it, of, of all the things we do to, um, to support people and, and, uh, be mindful socially of, uh, of not insulting others or being disrespectful. It seems like pretty, uh, pretty, pretty low on the list of harmful behaviors to, to get a club soda and not tell anyone it's a club soda. Yeah, no, I, I actually like all joking aside, like I, I think there is a benefit in that and making people around you feel as comfortable as possible. Cause it's part of that whole thing. Um, and I, you know, it, I think there's, uh, yeah, I think it was also just a benefit in them feeling comfortable and not worried that you're uncomfortable around them. And like, you know, just throwing that social dynamic and, out of the out of the whole interaction. I think that you think that I, think. I think that I'm judging you. <laughs> um, yeah, and then um, I think the the last thing that I had to add on this was just um, uh, you know excessive alcohol use is um, varies in in the way it appears, varies in in how many drinks that is and how often that is for for a given person. But I I think this is one of the areas where 
I feel like people really struggle when there's someone in their lives who they feel is drinking too much yeah. and how to actually broach that conversation without, um, not without running the risk of alienating that person, but sort of in a, in a way that's, um, that's loving and supportive and, uh, really just focused on that other person's well being. And I don't have any magical answers here. I just know that this is a conversation I've had to have before and, um, and wondering if you have any, uh, any tips or tricks there. So in, in terms of how to broach the subject of a, a friend or a loved one who's, um, who you think is, uh, is drinking excessively to the point where, where you're concerned about them. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know if I have anything super intelligent to say other than, um, the best approach I've had is really, looking into what, what my motivations are and making sure that how I'm approaching that conversation is completely a hundred percent out of love and care for that person. And just going into it with leading with that, leading with my heart around it and generally, um, just making, checking myself and making sure that I, I, you know, I don't have any other like motivations and uh, other like underlying thought processes that this is just really about my, how much I care about them. And that when I've really paused and looked, you know, internally, um, the, it's, it's gone better. Um, then, but I've, I've had it gone poorly, uh, go poorly. And, uh, that feels bad um, because it disrupts a, a relationship I care about. Because um, you know, I've never, I've never had that conversation with somebody I didn't care about. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can definitely say uh, I've, I've been uh, um, in both situations and and various uh, shades of gray in between of it going, you know relatively well and you know really sort of not a surprise for that person and just yeah. thankful that somebody cared enough to talk about it to extraordinarily defensive yeah. and uh and confrontational so um you know I, th I think no discussion of uh of alcohol its health benefits its harms etc would be complete without acknowledging that um you know this at the end of the day there's you know there's statistics about the substance itself but the nuances of alcohol use, uh, it's, you know, it's a role in social interaction, how to approach concerning drinking with people, um, people who you care about. Um, these are things that really, uh, weigh heavily on us. Um, and I, I think again, we'll, we'll, we'll post the links we mentioned, uh, and the resources we mentioned into the, um, into the, uh, the uh, show. podcast show notes um, so people can uh, people can take a look um, but definitely don't hesitate to reach out for help and some of these um, resources can be really helpful if you're thinking about talking to someone in your life who's struggling with excessive alcohol use and not just for uh, folks who need to reach out for their own um, for their own alcohol use and for assistance so uh, you know go ahead and, and explore and, and um, I would just say uh, it's challenging, but, uh, if you're concerned enough about somebody, um, they're going to thank you ultimately, yeah. uh, even if the initial conversation is not going to go that well. Right. Totally. Well, sort of a somber yeah. note to end on Carl, but, uh, but it's a big deal. Yeah. Uh, we know we, we, we have to, we got to talk about it. Um, but thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on and, and reviewing, uh, alcohol with me and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll come back on a, on a less somber note next time. I promise. Sounds great. It'll be, it'll be fun at that time. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for listening to the Wild Health Podcast. If you found it helpful, give us a five-star rating and write a review on iTunes. It really helps the podcast, and we greatly appreciate it. If you want to be a client or you want to work with us, go to wildhealth.com. Thanks again.